Hello, I'm Kristen Griego. I'm here with Ian Bousfield. Today, uh, we're going to talk about the 4147IB Getson. Would, would, you, would you like to talk about a little of the background? Yeah, sure. It was an interesting um, process that we went through. We decided to set out to create an instrument based on a set of requirements, rather than saying, okay, we're going to copy this or we're going to copy that. It was like, okay, I want this kind of sound, I want this kind of freedom. For me, it was very important to have an instrument that went through the whole registers, kind of like an automatic car, without having to go through a shift when you went from the upper middle register into the lower high register. You know, one that sort of spoke very, very easily. And I were, um, I've never been a, a fan of going bigger, bigger, bigger with instruments. You know, I wanted something that was going to be very nimble, very light, um, and yeah, that's kind of the that's kind of the basis that we started from, I think, wasn't it? Which was kind of a bit of a new direction for you, you know. It was it was a. I had actually been studying uh, your approach a little bit. Be two months before we actually got to work together, I was at University of Whitewater where Jimmy Wilson uh, was doing a master class after his performance, and I was listening to him talk about your approach with just the touch uh, on the note on the front of the note for articulation, because the front of his notes were were pretty special to me uh, in, in the mm. audience. And so, mm. actually I went on, you, on your YouTube channel and I started listening to this, and this was before we uh, even got together yeah. to work, and so I'd, I'd really been studying that approach. Yeah. And then uh, it helped me understand what you were after. And it, interestingly enough, when, when you gave me your requirements, it was that the instrument had to sound equally well on the other side of the bell as it did exactly. on this. And I remember when I, I, I flew over to Switzerland with it with an instrument, and I, I was pretty pleased with it to be honest. I was quite full of myself at that moment. But uh, watching your your wife walk around with a video camera, both sides of the bell, right? And that was a very nervous moment for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, actually, I notice more and more um, when I teach that it's very difficult to work with someone if they're not getting the same feedback that I am. You know, I've I've very often spoken to people and said, oh, you know, your sound is too bright or too aggressive. Can you, can, you, can you not hear that? And then you actually go and put your head neck on their shoulder kind of thing and hear what they're hearing, and it sounds great. You know, so I think that you know, similar feedback is, is very, very important. But that's an interesting point that you make um, regarding the um, articulation of an instrument. I think, um, I think articulation is back. I think the, the U.S. went through a phase where, you know, soft beginnings of notes was, was really the thing in the 80s and the 90s, but I think getting that ping and that clarity for the projection at the beginning of the note, you know, is definitely back over here. It never went out of fashion in Europe, but we always did it. So that was another big requirement for the instrument, which we have. Um, I think what we did... Because you remember when you came to Bern as well, we looked at some historic instruments. We looked at some old crushbeat trombones from the 1890s. And we kind of followed the development of instruments through from then to now. And we kind of said, if they were making instruments now, if they had the ability to make an instrument now, what would they have made? And that was kind of what we were thinking about. So it's like a, a modern take with a little bit of a historic aspect to it, you know? I think the sound is, is very expressive with mm -hmm. the 4147, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to hear people be able to uh, make the note be malleable right. within a sound range. They can make it sound dark if they blow warmer, slow, uh, slower air, exactly. or if, if they become expansive, yeah. and, or if they get a little more aggressive with the air, they can yeah. get the brilliance of a trombone, a brass instrument, yeah. without paper shredding. Right. I mean, I appreciate those trombones where you're kind of like railroaded into the middle of, of the note, and that's your sound, and it's very stable. I appreciate them, but... I get very bored with them very quickly because, you know, I need to be able to change this, the tone color. And it was interesting because I, I've taken on a few projects over the years, and, and this one uh, was, was very intriguing for me because when, when you gave me requirements of the instrument, and I, I studied the instruments you played in the past, the, the cons, the Yamahas, um, and, and so I wanted to understand where you were coming from. Mm -hmm. And so I would, I would actually gather these instruments and play on them. Right. And, and figure out what was really good in them and try and capture some of those, those qualities. Because yeah. they weren't bad instruments. No. They were good. Absolutely. But we were trying to capture the greatness in the, the uh, certain areas of those instruments and then expand upon that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and again, sort of going on to another, another point, 
that I think is, and we've talked about this a lot, finding the right equipment is so important for, for anyone. This is a general term. Um, I mean, I think we both know people going way back 30 years that had they been around now, they may have become professional players. Because we have equipment at our disposal now that we haven't had previously. I wish what I would have given to have had this when I started in my orchestral career. You know, things have moved on. As, as good as those instruments were 30 years ago, you know, God bless them. Um, but things, have, you know, design development has really moved forward, you know. So I think we're very lucky now. Most yeah, and within this design, I mean, we have minimalist bracing, so it doesn't get in the way of the resonance. And no matter, if we have to, if we have two different people building these instruments, the quality is not going to suffer because of the design. Right. Um, it, it, it was designed in, in a way that the, the, the human mounting it can't interfere yeah. with the resonance of the, the, or the final quality of the instrument. Yeah. Please. I, a lot of people always talk about wide body slides versus narrow slides. Uh -huh. Do you, and when, when we started this project, actually, I, I first had you on a wide slide, and yeah. we, then we made a switch, and all the lengths of the instrument had to change, which made it very fun for me. But I was going to say, that was the biggest challenge for you. I remember you kind of went off radar for about three months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but can you talk, talk to me about uh, your theories between wide, wide slides and uh, little narrower slides, which we ended up on? It's a matter of taste. For me, the air on a wide slide runs too fast. I don't like the feeling of... Um, of air disappearing into the trombone. Um, for me, I need a little bit of a cushion of some resistance. It's a very fine balance. If you get too much resistance, it's no good. But just that little bit of comfort there. And that I find I get with a narrower slide. I also have a tendency to play quite a lot of fast things, and that's difficult on a wider slide. Um, so in, in many ways, it's a question of what you, you, you grow up doing, what you're used to doing. And I'd only ever played on, on narrow slides. For me, I feel more of a contact to the instrument. I feel I can be more sensitive on, on this width of slide. Um, and it, for me, it's more personal. That's, that's the main thing. Again, I appreciate the, the wide slides. I, there are things on, that, on, on a wider slide that, you, that are definitely unique to that, certain things that you can do. But all in all, this is, you know, this is my kind of thing. You know? and, and the interesting thing is that some people say, well, you know, is it a bark slide or is it a concert? No, it's, it's got nothing to do with that. Holton had narrow slides. King had narrow slides. You know, it's, they're, they're just the, 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 the two different systems. Now, you recently got back with, uh, from a tour with uh, Vienna. Yeah, that was an interesting experience for me because we actually um, developed this instrument as I was leaving the Vienna Philharmonic. So although I'd done some work in the Lucerne Festival Orchestra, I'd basically given up playing in orchestras. And, you know, after nearly four years away, the Vienna Philharmonic said, you know, why don't you come, up, come back and do a block of work? And I said, well, I don't really do that kind of thing. And they said, well, we're doing Goethe Demelung and Pictures and Exhibition and Tchaikovsky Manfred Symphony. And I thought, well, if I'm ever going to go back, I'll go and do that. It was a nice long tour. So it was an interesting experience for me to try this out really in an orchestral setting. I've been using it you know, for all of my solo work, but to really open up one minute and then go to a hyper quiet chorale, the next one. You know, we, I was so happy to, you know, I had this hunch that we'd really got it right, or you'd got it right, but I had this hunch that it was right, you know, that it would cover what I needed in the, in, in the solo repertoire, but was also totally at home in the orchestra, and, you know, my feelings were, were confirmed. I mean, the, it doesn't explode when it's loud. Like you say, it's a question of how you put the air through the instrument. You have to be sensitive as to how you put the air through the instrument, where you can really let go and the sound will stay really big and really pure with that clarity of articulation that gets the projection out there. But the quiet chords are so comfortable because they've just got that little caution of resistance. You know, the problem with these instruments that, that go so freely for me is when, when a conductor does that and he has to be, then you have no, you have no sort of safety there, you know. And, so I, and I hear just that falls through. In, in the hall, I'll hear that when a player, it's a little too, they're falling in a little bit, they have to provide the compression a little bit too much right. here, and then it can become, I hear the tension in their body starting yeah. to come through the resonance of the sound. I don't, I think it's indisputable. Somewhere in the system, we have to have resistance. Now, 
if we don't have some resistance either in the mouthpiece or in the trombone, or a combination of the two, then we're going to need it here. If we don't have it here, it might come here, and it might come here. In other words, the freer the instrument, it might seem quite nice at the time, but as time goes by, you get very, very tense. But it's that question of balance, as with everything. And the balance of the, of, of the resistance on this is fantastic. I, w I was pleased to get a call from Ian when he was on tour in, in New York and hear that it was working uh, fantastic in the orchestra because uh, I heard you play at Eastman at the I yeah. ITF yeah. You know, two years prior, right. I believe. Yeah. And listening to his uh, solo uh, concert in the hall, the soft, he played, I don't know, it might as well have been an 80 bar phrase, you know, it was just soft, resonating holding this note beautifully, and the whole room was resonating uh, in the soft, and, and that meant a lot to me, but then I was curious how it would hold up in the orchestra, so it yeah. meant a lot to me to get yeah. that call, and <laughs> yeah. I could breathe a little sigh of relief, knowing yeah. that it was working well. In the yeah, orchestra. I did, I called you and I said, I wish I'd had this 30 years ago, yeah. which is, you know. Well, that, there's, a, there's a lot that went into this instrument, and I don't know where to start and stop. We have so many little details from the bell, which is a, we, we'd never made a bell like this uh, with the treatments. To, to make this, the bell and the instrument sound this way. Uh, and the combination of materials between the yellow brass and the, and the rose brass, it was a very delicate balance, but I, I think we've really done a fine job. I'm, I'm really pleased to have this mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. It's great. In fact, I'm, I'm having a great time here because some of you may recognize this room I'm in Getson. I'm just on the other side of that wall, they're making these. So every time I get a few hours to come up here, I always get the chance to check the, produ the uh, production line. And what is also a nice thing for trombone lovers is there is a variation. There's a slight variation. Some of them will have a little more focus, some of them are going to be a little bit warmer, ever so slight. And I love just going and feeling the different personalities of the instruments. The old instruments, they all had their own personalities. Um, and I find that's the case with these two, just ever so slight differences. Well, we appreciate you coming out to Elkhorn, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, heading up to Madison and hearing you a little later today. Yeah, right. Cool. Good. <laughs>